She's a track and field athlete and Olympic gold and silver medalist right here from Memphis, Tennessee. A Melrose graduate and a 2006 inductee of the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. Today, she's a fitness entrepreneur, philanthropist, motivational speaker, and wellness advocate. I'm Tracy Bethay. Thank you for joining me with a conversation with Dr. Rochelle Stevens. Welcome, Rochelle. Hey, I'm excited to be here. 2020, I am fired up. You look beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And we're so excited just to have a conversation with you. You mean so much to uh, beyond the Memphis community. You mean so much to six continents. And I want to start talking about that <laughs> right now. So a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Where did the love for track and field start? Was it as a child when we, we were outside playing and you know you were running the relay races and noticed that you were beating the boys quite a bit? Where did the love for track and field start? Actually, the love for track and field started, like you said, on the playgrounds uh, at Cherokee Elementary here in Memphis, and of course, racing the boys in the street from light pole to light pole. But really, what really inspired me uh, was the Wilma Rudolph story, and it came on television, and I watched the story, and I'm like, wow, I want to be like Wilma. Wow, I want to go to the Olympics. I didn't have a clue about the hard work, the commitment, the dedication uh, that was in detail with that. But all I knew was at the age of 12, I wanted to go to the Olympics. So the next day I woke up and I started jogging and knocking on the neighbor's doors like, hey, I'm going to the Olympics, hey, I'm going to the Olympics. And they was looking like, okay, little girl, okay, you, you going to the Olympics, okay. And I just ran off and I was just so excited. So, you know, to see something and, and to be inspired from someone on television and then to come back later on and emulate it, it was, it's just awesome. So did the competition start in high school? When did you start competing from high school to get to the Olympics? My mother was an athlete herself, oh. and she heard that I was outside racing people in the streets. So she was like, wait a minute, let me see what you got. And she was like, let me find a, a summer program or a track program to get you involved in. We still didn't know how fast I was. We was just on a hunch of a dream that I wanted to do and accomplish. And so we enrolled with the Memphis Recreations Track Club. And it was a summer program for the inner city children. It was about 200 uh, athletes from around the Memphis and surrounding area. And we had coaches to uh, help you figure out what what you would be best at, what event, your sport. And my uh, very first coach is uh, Tony Wakefield. And he saw that in me when I was 12. And he was like, girl, you're gonna be a star, you're gonna be a star. But I was thinking, yeah, you're just saying that because you want me to be out here in this hot weather running. It was, you know, Memphis is hot, 100 degrees every day. I was like, he just want me to be out here. But he saw that, that dream in me and he started putting in me uh, you know, the right kind of workouts and what kind of foods to eat and, and what schools that I was gonna run for. I was like, okay, I'm 12 years old. I'm not even thinking about college right now. But at the age of 12, he was already instilling in me that I would be a, tr a track star. Wow. And so on the field, uh, the races, the 400 meters, what were you or what did you like? And then what led you to the Olympics? What were the races that you liked? Well, like most kids, I like sprints. But when I started running against other girls my age, I wasn't as fast as I thought I was at that time. So uh, Tony put me over in the 800 meters, which is a half mile. And my mom was like, you should run the half mile. No one wants to run the long distance stuff. Why don't you dominate over there? And between the two of uh, them, that's what really got my start. And I earned 24 scholarships in track and field at 800 meters, although I won the state in the 400 and the 200 when I was at Melrose at the uh, TWSAA. So to uh, become an All-American about, mm, a lot of times I have lost count, <laughs> but to become an All-American, uh, I was a junior high city champion at 800 meters. I was the high school city regional district champion at 800 and 400 meters. So uh, my accolades was just adding up and that's what brought on the 20 scholarships. And when I meet other young athletes, I always ask them, what is it that you want to do? 
And now that you have Google, you can go on Google and see what other athletes are doing around the world so you can compare where you are so you can know that you need to pick up your pace or train even harder so you can uh, make yourself available for those scholarships that, that are out there. Wow, what is your most memorable? No, before we go there, I <laughs> wanna hear about your first big national out of the country. You moved from Melrose, you moved from Memphis, and now you're at your first Olympic game. Tell me about that. Where was that? My first Olympic Games was in 1992 in Barcelona, Spain. But before I made that, uh, you have to, you know, go by the guidelines or, or the steps. So my very first team I made was the World University Games, and that was in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. Wow. And of course, I didn't have a passport, didn't even know what a passport was, and most of uh, the college athletes, none of us had passports, so we had the experience of getting those passports in like 24 hours or less, and, and I was really nervous when I went over to, to Zagra. I was like, oh, I just can't run on this track. Oh my gosh, I can't get my rhythm down. And uh, one of the coaches said, look, it's the same thing, it's just in a different country. Don't get it confused, just get out here and represent Team USA. So I was really nervous about the very first time I went out the country, but uh, over, over that time, I have had the opportunity to race in over 50 countries, and uh, it's just something I never imagined. I, I used to watch the uh, Price is Right and play the game show. They said, you're going to Rome. And I'd be like, yeah, 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 I'm going to Rome. And I would bid on going to Rome, but not knowing that one day my talents would take me to uh, Rome and France and uh, Bulgaria, Russia, Yugoslavia, China. Uh, it, I just never knew that I would see Tokyo and Beijing and the Thailands and Cape Town and Johannesburg. So I have had a awesome career and was just able to see history in person to be able to see those castles in Edinburgh and it was just an awesome experience. Wow. Tell me about your first Olympic win. I won the silver medal the first Olympics. I was the anchor leg on the 4x400 four meter relay and our biggest competitor, all of them are the biggest competitors, but the Russians, and, and they had just became a part as the unified team, so they was no longer just representing Russia because they had gained their freedom, but And to, how old were you? How old was I then? Uh -huh. How old were you? Oh, I was in my 20s. Okay. So <laughs> you, most people, the only, the only people that go to the Olympics at an early age are like gymnastics and maybe swimming. But uh, to be the best in the world, it, it does really take time to reach those goals. It's, it's a lot of tough competition. But we won uh, second place to Russia, and I finished sixth place in the open 400 meters in lane one. So to finish sixth in the world, yes. uh, now it is uh, very encouraging to talk about. But at that time, to finish sixth place in the world, I was devastated. I was like, oh my gosh, I got towed up. Oh, I got whooped. But when I saw the video six months later, I didn't uh, realize that there were four other athletes and we all was battling for the bronze medal. But, but since I was in lane one, I was like, I just run for time. So when I saw the tape, I like, go, go. I was cheering for myself. I didn't realize that I was that close uh, to winning a bronze medal in the 400 meters in 1992 in Barcelona. But you still won a silver medal. That was amazing. It, yes, And what is that awesome. like? Because we watch it on television. What is that like when they get ready and they place the medal over you? It still had to be an amazing feeling. What was that like? It is an amazing feeling. Uh, the simple fact, all the athletes, we stay at the Olympic Village together. So we don't, the Americans not at one place. All of us are on the buses, the charter buses together. We eat together. We do almost everything together. And at night, you kind of sitting around and you're waiting to see who comes through the gate and who has a medal around their neck. You say, whoa, they got the silver. Oh my gosh, they won a bronze. Or if you're in a sport that's contact like boxing and, and you kind of come back with a black eye and you're limping or whatever, you're like, oh man, they didn't win. But you know, to be able to go back into the village and have a civil medal around my neck was like, wow, we got a silver medal. Uh, you have over 10,000 athletes that's there competing for gold, silver, and bronze medals. And to know that I was one of 40 American athletes to walk away with the silver medal is an honor. So Rochelle, you got the silver. Let's talk about the experience when you won the gold. Tell me about that. With you just saying it like that, 
tears came to my eyes instantly because just thinking about this may be my last opportunity to compete in the Olympics since they come around once every four years. Uh, this is my last time to be able to compete in front of uh, my home crowd because it was in the United States, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was just thinking about all of the last things that could happen. And I was like, it's either now or never. And my teammates, we all looked at each other and we didn't even say anything to each other because all of us probably had the same childhood dream and that was to win the gold medal. But we were predicted to win the bronze. So we were really determined to, you know, keep that gold medal on USA soil in hot Atlanta. And, you know, to win the gold medal, that you can't, even, you can't get any higher than that. And what was the race for? The four by 400 meter relay, and I was the first leg. So, oh. you know, I was the one to kick it off and, and put us in position. Uh, to be very competitive in that race. And uh, second place was Russia, no, Nigeria, and third was Germany. But it was a really close race. And, and it was like, who cares how close the race was? We won the gold, and that was, that's what was most important. It took 18 years uh, before I won that Olympic gold medal, and I, I would never forget that evening in Atlanta. Wow. Wow, now you should sleep with that around your neck at night. That oh, mother. I did. <laughs> <laughs> the first night, first few nights, you sleep with it around your neck because you're afraid someone's going to take it. It's kind of like when you get the, the money under your pillow for your tooth, the tooth fairy. <laughs> tooth fairy. It's like, oh, I don't need nobody to come in here and take my, my metal from me, so I'm going to just sleep in my metal for a few nights. So I have to ask you, like they do with the Grammys and the Oscars, so where do you keep all of your amazing medals and awards? <laughs> but, you know, thanks to the uh, gymnastics uh, girls telling me, oh, we keep them in the sock drawer. Sock? I think people really were keeping them in the sock drawer until they went on national television talking about it. So mine is safe and put in uh, a safe deposit box at one of my favorite banks. All right, yeah. wow. What is one of your was there ever a moment when you wanted to give up, a moment where you didn't think that, for whatever reason, that maybe I should try something else? Did you grow up, I know you said you grew up wanting to be an athlete, but was there a point while you were there and you were having to train for hours, because I'm sure it has to be a very you know, strenuous, we just think you get up and go and run, but it's so much more than that. Was there ever a moment that you wanted to give up? If so, what was it that made you stay the course? You know, anything that you want to do, it always takes hard work. If, it, if it's something easy, it's probably not worth going after. Uh, when you're waking up and every muscle that you never knew you had, is hurting and aching, and you're like, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna quit. I can't hardly walk, I can't hardly move, it hurts to sit down, it hurts to stand up. You wanna give up because you got to get immune to the pain and eventually it goes away. Uh, then you don't win every single race. You, it's, it's, it's a learning experience. You, 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 you get beat and your, your feelings are hurt, you're dropping tears and it's like, oh, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit. But it's, it's got to be that inner drive that's in you. It's something that you really want to have. You got to be tough against the naysayers and the haters and the press and, and everybody because, you know, even the press was like, oh my gosh, we thought she was so good. She only won the silver medal. I'm looking like, what? Only the silver? Do you know how hard it was to get the silver? But, you know, just listening to negative people sometimes will make you just give up on your dreams and you just have to really believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, then you will forget about what people are saying and what people are not saying. You will forget about how much hard work goes with it because in the long run, if you accomplish anything that you set out to do, rather it's what other people want you to do or, or how they think you should have accomplished it, if you accomplish it, that's what's most important. And that's what I had to learn. I had to learn what makes Rochelle happy. And, being in shape and being one of the greatest athletes in the world made me a very happy person. Wow, and of course, Memphis is definitely happy <laughs> because you are a legend, truly you wow. are. So do you stay in touch with maybe some of the relationships or runners, people that you uh, ran against, either your past people that you were on the same team with, do you still stay in touch with them after all these years? 
with thanks to uh, social media <laughs> and Facebook, and it's like I get to cheer on my friends from around the world because it's, it's bigger than just the United States. Like I said, we all traveled the world together uh, representing our countries, representing our sponsors, and to see them now as uh, the sports, the minister of sports in Nigeria, and to see them as uh, the head coaches, athletic directors, uh, to be named now the USA Olympic coaches. It's like, wow, that's, that was my teammate, that was my teammate. That's like bragging rights. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're younger, you're not quite thinking that way. But when you come out of the sport, you're just so happy for your colleagues to see that they're doing well and just instead of pushing and just keep pushing. I believe I have taken my athletic discipline and uh, goal setting and self-motivation over into my, my daily life because I treat life exactly the same way I treated my sport and always want to be on top, always want to be the best that I could be. And so you retired on top. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and after retirement, <laughs> tell us some of the things that you started to do, your philanthropy work, your uh, entrepreneur. Tell us some of the things that you've done since retirement. Well, actually, before I retired, I was already involved uh, with the philanthropy. Uh, the Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet, we are celebrating 30 years wow. this year, May 30th. And I'm so, so excited because before I became an Olympian, I had already started the Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet. And the reason I started it is because there's so much talent in our area and a lot of the college coaches uh, kind of stopped recruiting in the Memphis area. So I was like, I know these coaches, I know them personally, and if I can just round up these athletes and let them have the same opportunity that I had, they can possibly go to college and graduate or earn a full scholarship like I did. And that was the real reason for putting on the Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet. And since 1990, over 30,000 athletes have come through my meet, has competed in the meet, uh, hundreds have received scholarships and graduated, uh, have gone on, and some even come back and now bring their track teams and their children and grandchildren to my track meet. And it's a real legacy that I have built, not knowing that's what I was setting up to do, but I just wanted to give back uh, to other athletes, like someone gave their time and uh, commitment to me, and that's my way of giving back for the Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet. In 30 years, hey, that is bigger than winning that gold medal uh, to me. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I started Rochelle's Health and Wellness, and, and I have helped thousands of uh, people lose weight, get healthy, look and feel good as gold. I, um, at my day spa, I was offering uh, body wraps, and tummy wraps, mm -hmm. facials, everything about just looking good. You know, when you look good, you want to do better. You, you're nicer to people, and, and when you're feeling good, hey, you, you feel like working. And so I really enjoy uh, the, the things that I have put in place for myself to just be able to give back in so many different ways. And, you know, I, I never want to just dwell on what I did 20 years or 30 years ago. I like to keep it, keep moving. it moving, keep it moving <laughs> with new things, new ideas, creative thoughts, creative ideas. And that's what it's all about. You, you don't stop. And if you did stop on that dream of that goal, I'm just want to encourage people to pick it back up. It's still there. You know, your dream is awesome. And all you have to do is work at it to make it come to fruition. And you definitely are keeping it moving because now <laughs> we can add to your resume, author. Right, right, you just right. wrote a children's book? Yes, uh, Run Like Rochelle. Run Isn't Like Rochelle. Cute? Run Like Rochelle. I love it. And I am stressing healthy habits and self-discipline, uh, self-esteem tips, encouraging the young people to dream and dream big and and just let you know you have hard work before you rather you want to be an athlete or entertainer a doctor or lawyer uh, if you want to be an educator anything that you want to do in life it takes time it takes commitment and you have to finish it to the to the end of that course in order for it to come to pass. And that book is for pre-K to like elementary. I was just gonna ask you, so it's for pre-K through elementary, because I think people need to understand the importance of getting our children to know at an early age, work ethic and things of that nature is so important. And so those are some of the things that you share in the book. 
Yes, uh, most definitely, because it is important. You have to instill those things in them. And out of the book, it's a, it's a very short read. It's, it's uh, color illustrated. It has the, everything is like cartoon. Of course, they're me. But at the very end, the very last page, I asked the question, what is your dream? And it's a big sheet so the parent or that child can write down their dreams at that age and, and note what year and how old they are. So when, when that time comes around and that dream come alive, hopefully a pull back out the book and say, remember when you wrote this in Rochelle's book? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I really get into motivating others. It doesn't make a difference how old or how young you are. Everyone needs motivation and they need a coach at some time in their life. And you talked about, because we're at the top of the year, the importance of eating healthy, even for children. You know, studies are saying that many of our children are obese. And so I um, know that that's something very important and close to your heart. Uh, just being able to eat right, eating healthier. That's just natural for me, maybe because I am an athlete mm -hmm. and we was kind of forced to eat the right things. You know, our bodies are like a car. And, and every now and then you get your oil changed in your car. So we need to detoxify our bodies as if it's a car, because if you're constantly putting fast food, processed food, overcooked food, old food, junk food into your body. You're stepping then, on my toe. Then, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, then, that's okay, I then need it. But what happens is your body can't, can't properly function and properly perform at its best capacity because of the things you put it into your system. And so when you start focusing on eating your vegetables, knowing that certain vegetables can help fight cancer, like broccoli, cauliflower, uh, eating your, your spinach and your kale and, and avocados. Mm -hmm. And if you want to help lower your blood pressure, knowing that if you drink uh, apple cider vinegar or have some carrot juice to help with your vision, is it, our food is really medicine. And if you keep putting the right foods into your body, then your body will continue to function in the way it's supposed to go. Something as simple as drinking water, yeah. a half a gallon, it keeps our organs alive. Our bodies are like a plant. And if you don't put enough water in it, we just droop over. And if you're, if you're feeling sluggish, if you're feeling lazy, it's because you need water. So if you can see that that plant, like, oh my gosh, my plant needs some water, and you just you try to drown it, you know, you just keep pouring all that water and then all of a sudden the plant will start raising back up and you give it a little sunlight and you're like, wow, this plant came back to life. Our I, body's like that. I'm listening to all of this wealth of information that you are sharing. <laughs> And because you have traveled all, all over the world as an Olympian, yes. Rochelle, you could have gone anywhere in the world. Was it your decision after retirement to come back to home, to come back to Memphis? Yes, it, it was. I always loved home. Um, I have had the opportunity and still have opportunities to live anywhere that I would like, including, you know, Europe. I love London. I love Nice. Okay, I love anywhere where I want, okay? <laughs> So I have a lot of places, uh, you know, that I really enjoyed while I was traveling. And I can see myself, you know, possibly living in other locations. But I'm a Memphis girl, and I just love giving back to uh, the fellow Memphians and just proud to be home to be able to give back to the community and would like to do even more. Because what I have done has only just touched the surface, but I can always do more. Wow. Well, we're so glad that you decided to stay home, come back home. <laughs> Let me ask you this, what's in store for Rochelle C. Stevens in 2020? Well, this is the Olympic year, so I am gonna have front row seats cheering on all the other Olympians from Team USA and around the world uh, for those that will go to Tokyo and race. And it, in fact, I believe we, we won a silver medal when I was in Tokyo for the World Championships. But to put on the 30th Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet, to promote Travel the World by Foot, my autobiography, just talking about some of the countries that I just mentioned, and to also promote the 30th Rochelle Stevens Invitational Track Meet, and, you know, just be the best that I can be, hopefully get married, find find love, love, find me or something. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just excited about 2020. Wow, you have a busy 2020. So how does Rochelle Stevens relax and unwind? When, you, when you're not d dealing with anything, how do you center yourself? How do you just relax and unwind? 
Actually, I, I relax and I wind every single day. My environment is very relaxing. I exercise about four days out of the week. I have my own personal gym, my own dry center in my home. So I, I relax every day. I mean, I love doing facials for myself. I just can't do the massages, but I have the equipment at my home to do those things and just to stay healthy and stay motivated. Uh, I believe whenever I'm a, at a beach or a swimming pool, I get motivated to say, wow, I think this will make a great speech. And I write this, these awesome motivational speeches and, and contact different ones. I love uh, speaking to corporate America and, and all of that. So speak to uh, someone right now. What would you say, especially to a young person uh, that has a desire to get into track and field, what would you say to them? We're not just track and field, but just in life in general. And, you know, I would um, ask if, you know, people will close their eyes at any of my speaking events and everyone's eyes are closed. And so when they hear the clap, then you open your eyes. And so it, it goes something like it to say, some people dream of success while others wake up and work hard at it. And so I inspire them to work hard for that dream, to push for what it is that you want. Because if you stay asleep or if you don't put in the work, then that dream will never come alive. You have to put in the work, you have to put in the time and believe in yourself. Most importantly is to believe in yourself and know that you can do all things, you know, through Christ that strengthens you. And I'm a believer in, in Christ. So of course I will emphasize what I believe in as well. Rochelle, it has been such an amazing honor and Thank pleasure uh, to speak with you on today. You have shared a wealth of information Thank you. and we definitely wish you continued success. Definitely a name you will continue to hear. We thank Rochelle and we thank you so much for joining us for a conversation with Rochelle Stevens.